When creating meshes for CFD, you may have found that either the mesh generator or the CFD code itself, when you import the mesh, raises warnings about the aspect ratio of the cells. Some of you who've carried out a lot more CFD may also have noticed that these aspect ratio warnings seem to differ between different CFD codes and different mesh generators. Some of them say that an aspect ratio of 500 is acceptable, whereas some of them may say that aspect ratios of 1000 or 2000 are acceptable. What I'm going to be doing in this video is actually showing you what effect aspect ratio has on the numerics of the CFD code. And there are actually some different considerations that you need to have depending on if you're running a steady state or a transient CFD simulation. So if you've come across aspect ratio warnings before and you want to know what's really going on behind the scenes, this is the video for you. Definitely wa watch all the way through until the end of the video because towards the end of the video, I'm gonna be giving you uh, recommendations for how you can look at your mesh and assess whether the aspect ratio that you've got is acceptable. Right, let's get into the video. So let's start things out with a simple definition of aspect ratio. For a 2D square or rectangular cell, the aspect ratio is easy to define. It's just the ratio of the longest side of the rectangle to the shortest side length of the rectangle. Now for more complex shapes like triangles or polygons or 3D shapes, the aspect ratio is more difficult to define. And in general, there are many different ways that you could define the aspect ratio for a regular polygon and different CFD codes and mesh generators use different definitions. And one example of a definition that you could use is you could draw a bounding box around the shape and you can create a bounding box just by taking the minimum X, Y, and Z coordinates and the maximum X, Y, and Z coordinates of all of the faces and facets of the cell and then using that to create a box and then defining the aspect ratio as the ratio of the largest area of the bounding box to the smallest area of the bounding box. That's one possible way you could define aspect ratio for a general 3D polygon. Another way you could do it is you could just take the distance from the centroid of the cell to each of the face centers and then take the aspect ratio as the ratio of the longest of those distances to the shortest of those distances. Now, even from this quite brief discussion and thinking things through for yourself, you can probably see that there are many different possible definitions and interpretations of aspect ratio in general for 3D polygons. And this is often why your mesh generator and your CFD code uh, and if you switch to a different CFD code, while often they will give different values for what the largest aspect ratio is for the cells in your mesh. Now, for this talk, I don't really want to focus on the definition of aspect ratio. I actually want to focus on the effect of aspect ratio on the CFD code, because that's going to be far more useful to you. And so, of course, when you create your mesh, Generally, you just want to have a look at the aspect ratio and see, is it large or is it small? And maybe not worry about the exact value because that can vary depending on the definition that's used. And often what you'll find, of course, when you make your CFD mesh and you import it into your CFD code or you run uh, mesh checks on your mesh, you may find that warnings are raised by the CFD code when there are high aspect ratio cells present. And the warnings may look something like this. And in addition to there being different definitions for what the aspect ratio is for general cells, also the cutoff point for what a high aspect ratio cell is, is different for different CFD codes and mesh generators. Some codes may take values as low as 100 for being a high aspect ratio, while others may go up to two or 3,000 as being a high aspect ratio cell. And I don't really want to focus on those exact numbers. What I want to focus on in this talk is explaining to you what effect the aspect ratio actually has on the numerics of the CFD code so that you can understand it and then really use that understanding to improve the quality of your meshes and to know whether you need to worry about these warnings or not. And aspect ratio actually has a different effect on steady state CFD calculations and transient CFD calculations. 
and I'm going to be looking at the effect on steady state calculations first and then towards the end of the talk I'm going to be looking at transient calculations. So then for your particular application you know which effect of aspect ratio to focus on. The way I'm going to explain the effect of aspect ratio on steady state CFD is just with a simple example problem. And you can always follow along with this example problem by hand, it's very straightforward. And what we're going to be doing is considering a rectangular cell uh, in a mesh just of three cells like the one you can see here on the screen. And we're considering that bottom left corner cell which is connected to two other cells on its top and right sides and then it has a boundary on the bottom face and the left face of the cell. So a very simple mesh, and you'll notice that these are rectangular cells, so they do have an aspect ratio that's greater than one. And what I'm gonna do for this example problem is just write an equation for conservation of energy for this particular cell. And how that conservation of energy is going to look for the cell is the balance of the heat flux passing out of each of the faces of the cell will balance the heat generation within the cell. And I like to use conservation of energy because it's an easy concept to understand, but of course you can extend this to other quantities like momentum and species concentration and things like that. And for this example problem, what I'm going to be doing is specifying that on the bottom and left faces of the cell, we have adiabatic boundary conditions. So the heat transfer across those faces is zero and the conservation of energy for our particular cell is gonna be really simple. We only need to consider the heat flux across two of the faces, which I've labeled as Q12 to represent the heat transfer from the cell one in the bottom left corner to cell two, which is the cell on the right. And then I've got Q13, which is representing the heat transfer coming out of cell one into cell three. So we're gonna have those two heat fluxes coming out of the cell, and they're going to balance the rate of heat generation within the cell. And how I'm going to do that is just by introducing a general volumetric source term, which I'm gonna call S, and of course the steady state uh, energy balance for this particular cell is given there in equation one. It's just Q12 plus Q13. So the two heat fluxes coming out of the cell must be equal to the energy generated within the cell for conservation of energy to be satisfied. And how we're gonna proceed with this derivation is writing those two heat fluxes, Q12 and Q13, in terms of the temperature gradient across the faces. And we're gonna be using Fourier's law of heat conduction to do that. So it's a very simple problem of conduction and heat generation in a single cell in the mesh. And this type of scenario you find in a lot of different uh, CFD uh, problems. So let's start with the right face. So this is the smaller face of that rectangular cell. And Q12, which is the heat flux out of cell one into cell two, will be equal to minus because the heat flows in the opposite direction to the temperature gradient. So when the temperature is reducing, we have positive heat flux, and that's why there's the minus sign there. Have minus Ka, K being the thermal conductivity, A being the area, A12 being the small area connecting cells one and two together. And then we have the temperature difference, T2 minus T1, and then divided by the distance between the centroids, which is X2 minus X1 magnitude. So that's that distance there on the bottom and the temperature difference there on the top. And we can use the same approach for the top face of the cell. Q13, again, is gonna be equal to minus K, the thermal conductivity. Now, A is A13. And I wanted to be really clear here that this time we're using the large face, that top face of the cell, that area, which is A13. And this is ultimately what's gonna come into our consideration of aspect ratio later. So we've got A13, that's the area, and then the temperature gradient, T3 minus T1, and the distance is now X3 minus X1. It's the distance between those two centroids across the face. And of course, you can see from this diagram that the centroids are now closer together. X3 minus X1 is smaller than X2 minus X1 because of the aspect ratio of this cell. And that's gonna be really important for us later on. So we now have our two equations. We've got equation four, which is our conservation of energy. And then we can substitute in the previous equations for Q12 and Q13, Fourier's law, and that allows us to arrive at equation five.
Again, this is still conservation of energy. The sum of the heat fluxes passing out of that cell is equal to the volumetric source term. And the standard approach in CFD and the finite volume method is for us to rearrange that equation in terms of the unknown temperatures at the centroids of those three cells, T1, T2, and T3. And you can do the rearranging and we arrive at equation six. And what you can see, this is quite a long equation, but on the left-hand side, we just have a term in brackets multiplied by T1, that's the temperature at the centroid of the cell that we're interested in, and then plus T2, that's the temperature on the right at the centroid of that cell, multiplied by a term in brackets, and then T3 again for the temperature at the top, and that's gonna be equal to the volumetric source term S. And I've just made a small note here that we are only considering uh, heat conduction here, or sometimes known as diffusion. And I haven't considered uh, convection or advection, which would happen if we had a moving fluid in this analysis, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. For now, we're only considering conduction. And I also wanted to just make a small side point here that that previous equation in the box there in equation six, you can derive it from first principles using Fourier's law and conservation of energy like we did, but you can also derive it uh, by applying the finite volume method to the steady state thermal diffusion equation, which you can see there in equation seven. And you can apply the finite volume method, integrating over the volume of the cell, and then using Gauss's divergence theorem to express that volume integral in terms of surface integrals. Uh, and then you can rearrange the terms and you'll arrive at equation 11, which is equivalent to the equation we had on the previous slide. I don't want to go through the finite volume method in too much detail here. I've been through this in other videos and in courses, and you can find more detail uh, for this approach there. But what I wanted to do is just leave this up on the screen. So if you want to pause the video and go through the finite volume method for yourself, you will arrive back at that same equation six. But for now, carrying on and thinking about the aspect ratio, let's think a little bit more about those terms in the brackets of our equation. And I want you to start by looking at the first bracket there, which is multiplied by T1. And what you see within the bracket is that we have the conductivity A multiplied by A12, that's the small area, and then divided by x2 minus x1, that's the long distance. And then we have an, another term, k times a13, it's the larger area, then divided by the smaller distance. And if you look at all the other brackets, you can see that this pattern appears every time. All of the coefficients depend on this ratio of the area divided by the distance delta x. And you can see that this is where the effect of the aspect ratio will be coming in. The aspect ratio indirectly affects the ratio A over delta X. Once we elongate that cell, we find that the areas of two of the phases are getting smaller and also the distance between the centroids across the face is getting bigger. And to really understand how aspect ratio affects A over delta X, let's just consider a quick example where for this example, let's assume our cell has an aspect ratio of 100. So that long distance is going to be one meter and then the small distance is going to be 0 0.01 meter. So clearly one divided by 0 0.01 is 100. We have an aspect ratio of 100. And now let's look at those two faces. For the face on the right, A over delta X is of course going to be 0 0.01 divided by one and that gives us 0.01. And if we do the same for that long top face, the area is now one and delta X is 0.01. So A over delta X is now equal to 100. And you can see that those two ratios, A over delta X, they're really different. They're not just different by a factor of 100, they're actually different by a factor of 100 squared. And we're gonna see that coming in in a bit more detail later. What I want you to do is just substitute those values into our previous equation, in equation 12, and I've just kept the thermal conductivity K as an unknown in there. We're gonna assume that it's constant and it's the same in all cells in the mesh. And you substitute in the numbers, and if you look at the brackets, you can start to see in equation 13, you've got 0.01K plus 100K for T1, and then you've got minus 0.01K for T2 and 100K for T3, that's equal to S. If we just rearrange and bring T2 and T3 to the other side, 
we have equation 14. And what I'm going to do now is just make a small approximation. And that small approximation is just going to allow me to divide everything through by 100.01k. And that approximation is, I'm going to assume that 100.01k is just equal to 100k. And that is a small typo there. Of course, I've noticed the k should be a lowercase k. Uh, but moving past that, if we make that approximation, we arrive at equation 16, where t1 is approximately equal to t2 multiplied by 0 0.01 divided by 100.01 plus t3 plus the source term divided by 100.01 Kelvin. And uh, um, K for the conductivity, sorry, not Kelvin. And what we can see is that that first bracket there, T2, is approximately equal to one divided by the aspect ratio squared. And T3 is just multiplied by one. So what's equation 17 telling us? Equation 17 is telling us that T1, that's the temperature at the centroid of the cell in the corner is approximately equal to T3. So those values are approximately equal and then plus a contribution from T2 multiplied by one divided by the aspect ratio squared. So what does this mean? This means is that if the aspect ratio is large, so imagine the aspect ratio is 100 or even 1000 say, we can see that if we change T2 by two degrees or five degrees, that's gonna have a very, very small effect on T1. T1 is hardly going to notice changes in T2 at all. Whereas if we make a change to T3, say T3, the temperature goes up by five degrees, then the temperature will almost go up by five degrees in T1 as well. We can see that T1 is much more sensitive to changes in the temperature of T3 across that large face than it is to changes in temperature for T2. So there's almost a decoupling between the cells that are on the high aspect ratio and small aspect ratio um, faces of that cell. But why is, why is this happening? Why are these coefficients changing so dramatically? Why are the numbers really biasing T1 towards T3 and not T2? Well, we can also think about this physically as well. Imagine you start with a square cell, a perfect square, and then we're going to slowly stretch that cell out, increasing its aspect ratio. As we increase the aspect ratio of the cell and stretch it out, the small areas of the cell, um, their area reduces, and also the distance between the centroids across that face increase. So that makes diffusion or heat conduction less effective over the small area and more effective over the larger area. So the heat wants to go across the large face and it's gonna be less and less effective across that small face. And it's two effects together. It's the area and the distance. And this is why we get the aspect ratio squared dependence uh, on, the effect, on the effect of heat conduction. And if we extend this out to the full matrix equation where we assemble a full set of uh, the coupled linear algebraic equations for the system, we're going to find that those matrix coefficients, some of them are going to be very large and some of them are going to be very small. And the, dis the difference between those, of course, is depending on the aspect ratio. And now I want to just think a little bit about the underlying equations that we're solving, because the example I just showed here was just for pure conduction or pure thermal diffusion uh, in the energy equation. But of course, in a CFD code, we're also solving the Navier-Stokes equations. We may be solving turbulence equations and other equations. And all of these transport equations have a diffusion term in them. And I've got those diffusion terms highlighted there in equations 18 and 19 for the Navier-Stokes and thermal energy equations. Those particular terms are going to have an aspect ratio dependence in them. When the aspect ratio goes to a thousand, then the aspect ratio squared is a million. And so some of those small terms are going to tend to zero. They're going to get very small. However, what you can see in equation 18 and equation 19 is that we also have advection terms or convection terms as they're sometimes called in these equations. 
And those terms are also going to contribute coefficients into that bracket that's multiplied by T1, T2, and T3. So even if that contribution from diffusion across that small face gets really, really small, we still have a contribution from advection, which is advecting thermal energy across the face. And so this is why when you have high aspect ratio cells in a steady state solver, they don't tend to have a significant effect on the Navier-Stokes and energy equations. In most flow scenarios, advection is significant. And so this uh, transport mechanism dominates diffusion. So even if there is some aspect ratio dependency in the diffusion terms there, it's not noticeable. However, there is a key difference with the pressure correction equation. If we're solving an incompressible flow with a pressure-based solver, uh, like is used in most CFD codes, um, then we're going to be solving uh, a pressure correction equation. And the key difference between the pressure correction equation and the Navier-Stokes and thermal energy equations is that the pressure correction equation only contains a diffusion term and a source term. There's no contribution from advection in the incompressible pressure correction equation. Slightly different if there's a compressible flow, but in an incompressible flow, we just have an equation that looks something like equation 20. And you can see on that left-hand side, you've got nabla dot and then one over AP multiplied by the pressure gradient. And that's a very similar form to the diffusion terms that you can see in the Navier-Stokes and thermal energy equations there. You've got the nabla dot, a coefficient, multiplied by a gradient. In this case, P is the pressure or the pressure correction. And there's no advection term there. So that really means that when we have high aspect ratio cells in a steady state solver, they can affect the coefficients in the pressure correction equation and make the pressure correction equation more difficult to solve because corrections to the pressure in adjacent cells will have less of an effect on each other when that information is being transported across that smaller area and the larger distance between the centroids. And particularly if you're an open foam user, you may have noticed when you run incompressible codes that when you have high aspect ratio cells, that often the pressure, uh, the pressure equation takes many more iterations to solve than the Navier-Stokes and thermal energy equations. And this is why, because there's an aspect ratio dependence in the diffusion term. So that's the steady state CFD. Uh, addressed. We're seeing that aspect ratio is really affecting the pressure correction equation mostly through the diffusion term. But what about when we have a transient CFD calculation? Well, you may remember from some of my previous videos that transient calculations are often limited by the current number. And what is the current number? Well, physically, the current number is just a ratio of distances. It's a ratio of the distance traveled by the flow across the cell to the width of the cell within a single time step. So you can almost think of moving through a single time step and seeing how far does that flow push across the cell. And transient calculations are often limited by certain restrictions on the current number. For many calculations, we often need to keep the current number less than one for either stability or for accuracy reasons. And so what this means physically is that within a single time step, the flow needs to have convected less than the width of the cell across the cell. And you can see that in the two diagrams I've got for you there on the slide. If the current number is less than one, we've only convected across a bit of the cell during that time step. But if the current number is, less, is greater than one, we've moved across the entire cell within one time step. So you can almost think of it like the flow has just moved through the cell and hasn't really felt the presence of the cell within that time step. But what does this mean for aspect ratio? What does this mean for the aspect ratio of the cells? Well, if we think about the example I've got for you here on the slide, for a normal cell like like we saw on the previous two slides, within a given time step, the flow is going to convect part way across the cell. And as long as that distance is less than the cell, our uh, cell width, our current number is less than one and our stability and accuracy requirements are going to be fine. But what happens if we rotate that cell so that now the thin distance of the cell is facing the flow? Well, what you can see now is that that same flow is actually able to move all the way across the distance of 
that cell within a given time step. So when we have high aspect ratio cells, this can produce uh, some current number difficulties, but it depends on the flow direction and the flow velocity. And this is really, really important. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about this over the next few slides. And you can use that understanding. You really want you to be thinking about how far the flow is pushing across the width of a cell in a time step. That's how I want you to be thinking about this with the transient calculations. If you think of a boundary layer or very close to the wall in your CFD domain, often we have very high aspect ratio cells there. And the reason we have that is normally because we have a distance limitation, normally a Y plus limitation. And so we need our cell to be very, very thin, normal to the wall. And of course, that then means that in the flow direction, our cell has a high aspect ratio. And this is what raises the warnings for the CFD code. But when we're running a transient calculation, if you think of the boundary layer that's physically going to develop normal to the wall, then very close to the wall, the velocity itself is very low. Not only is it very low, but we know the velocity is going to be running almost parallel to the wall. So if you think about the distance that flow is going to be moving across that high aspect ratio cell, it's not actually going to be moving all the way along the distance of the cell because the cell is perfectly aligned with the wall and the flow is actually very low there. Moving higher up the boundary layer, our aspect ratios typically increase if we have a growth ratio, but now the flow velocity is moving faster and so we're able to move a greater fraction of the distance across the cell. So surprisingly, Boundary layer cells where we have those high aspect ratios typically don't cause a problem for transient CFD because the flow velocity is very low there. Of course, this doesn't mean that the high aspect ratio cells are okay for the steady solver. They will still tend to slow down the pressure correction equation. Now, this is really the part of the talk where I want you to start thinking about your own meshes and your own CFD cases, and you'll really start to see where the subtleties of aspect ratio come in to CFD meshes. What I want you to do is think about the flow passing around a sharp 90 degree bend, which you can see there in the diagram on the left. And there are a number of different ways we could mesh this bend. And on the slide for you here, I've got two examples of a way you could mesh the bend. For mesh one, what we've got is we've got the mesh wrapping around that corner with a structured, uh, with a structured approach where the cells are stretched so that they can move around the bend. And you may have attempted a blocking structure, something like this before in your own CFD codes. And for the second mesh, what I've done is used a Cartesian mesh where the cells are all perfect squares or perfect rectangles. And both of these meshes maintain those thin boundary layer cells along the walls, both on the inside and the outside of the bend but you can see the internal structure of the cells as we go around the corner is quite different. Now, if you think in terms of aspect ratio for a transient CFD simulation, the second mesh is actually going to perform very poorly. And the reason for that is because of the blocking structure, those thin cells that start on the inside bottom wall of the bend are passing all the way across the bend so that the flow as it encounters the bend is now normal to the thin axis of those high aspect ratio cells. So you've got a high flow velocity and you've got a very thin cell and this is probably going to result in high current numbers. And so to maintain stability and accuracy, that second mesh is probably going to need small time steps. Now, if you contrast that to mesh one, you can see that actually away from the wall, the cells are quite large. So even though the flow velocity is large, the cells are large. So within one time step, the flow is only going to move a fraction of the distance across that cell. And so we're going to get a low current number. So actually, you can see from this very simple example that what's really going to be limiting you for your transient calculation is thin cells that are normal to a high flow velocity or a, or a flow direction. So if you've got those thin boundary layer cells, if they're coming off the wall and going into the flow and not fanning out, they can be a problem for transient CFD. Now, what about the trailing edge of an aerofoil? This is a much more subtle uh, example and is actually quite challenging. And 
is really how I want you to start thinking about your meshing and where your aspect ratio cells are. Now, typically, if we had a structured mesh for this aerofoil, what we might do is we might have our inflation layers wrapped around our aerofoil, or we may have a C blocking structure going all the way around the aerofoil, and then those thin cells are going to trail off the sharp tailing edge of the aerofoil, as you can see there. Now, what's going to happen will really depend quite a lot on what the flow is doing near the, near the trailing edge of the aerofoil. And you can see just from this small diagram that I've got here that if the flow is traveling parallel to those high aspect ratio cells, then the current number is probably going to be quite low because we've got a small flow velocity traveling along the long axis of the cells. But of course, if we now have some flow separation, for example, or if our flow angle changes slightly, then we could have high, high velocity flow coming across the thin axis of those high aspect ratio cells, particularly far downstream of the aerofoil. And that will then of course result in high current numbers and cause us to need to reduce the time step. So what's really important here and what I really want you to take away from this talk is that for transient CFD, if you have high aspect ratio cells in your mesh, you may end up needing to use smaller time steps so that you can keep that current number below one or below 0.5, whatever metric you're happening to target. But the important thing is, is that this depends on where the cells are in the mesh. And this is exactly why CFD codes trigger an aspect ratio warning and not an aspect ratio error. Because a cell with an aspect ratio of 100 or 1000 may not be a problem for you at all if it's attached close to the wall and you know that the flow is running parallel to the wall then the velocity is going to be very small and that aspect ratio cell isn't going to limit your current number at all but the important thing is you have to look at your mesh and judge for yourself and you can either do this when you're constructing your mesh or during the post-processing when you're looking at the flow field and the current number field and you can always look back at my previous video on the current number if you want a bit more help with doing that so just to wrap up everything I've talked about in this video, diffusion, if we have the diffusion term in the energy equation, the momentum equation, or the pressure correction equation, diffusion becomes less effective out of the smaller phase of high aspect ratio cells, and it becomes more effective out of that large phase because we've got that large surface area and the small distance, and we've got this double effect of increasing area and reducing delta x, and this is why the, the effectiveness of diffusion depends on the aspect ratio squared. This is why most CFD codes tend to put their aspect ratio warnings around an aspect ratio of uh, say a thousand because a thousand squared is a million and a million one times 10 to the six is close to where typical uh, residuals are reduced to when people run CFD codes. And of course this is particularly the case for the incompressible pressure correction equation because it's dominated by diffusion and we don't have any contribution from convection which can overcome the small contribution from diffusion. And this is why a high aspect ratio will slow down steady state pressure correction equation solutions. And of course, we also looked at transient calculations and in a transient calculation, if we have a high aspect ratio cell, that may increase the current number and force the user to reduce the time step. And so for you, when you're building your mesh, it's really important to not only focus on what the number of the aspect ratio uh, cell is, but where in the mesh the high aspect ratio cell is. And hopefully after watching this talk, you've got a good example of how to look at your mesh and think about what the flow is going to be doing in those places. So that wraps up my video on aspect ratio. Let me know in the comments section, did you find this video useful and interesting? Has it helped you to really understand what's going on behind the scenes with CFD codes? And has it helped you to go back and look at your own meshes? And do you have some more confidence now in where high aspect ratio cells might be acceptable and where they might be a problem? As always, I really appreciate your continued support uh, supporting the channels and watching watching the videos. Um, so let me know how you found it in the comments section and I'll see you in the next video.